Chapter Twelve of Grace Harlowe Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane. Chapter Twelve. Grace meets the Countess. Grace eyed Mr. Davis steadily for a few seconds. May I ask for a specific statement, sir? You may. Charges have been made that, if true, would make necessary the sending of you back to the States, Mrs. Gray. You see, we have to be very particular with regard to the actions of our workers. It is an inflexible rule that each one must live up to the regulations both of the army and of our organisation itself. If I have transgressed, I am indeed sorry. However, I am not aware that I have. Who makes the charges? And what are they? Asking you to pardon the bluntness of my inquiries. You are quite justified in making them. Your inquiries in as direct language as you can command. The charges are that you are flippant, that you neglect your legitimate work and spend your time in frivolous enjoyment with the soldiers who visit your canteen. In other words, you will pardon my bluntness, that your actions are flirtatious. I am sorry to have to say this. Mr. Davis was evidently ill at ease, and Grace observed, avoided meeting her eyes. What have you to say in answer to these charges, Mrs. Gray? If I may do so, I should like to reply by asking you a question, sir. You are at liberty to do so. Then may I ask what you think of these charges, as to their truth, I mean? Mr. Davis hesitated, fingered his papers uneasily, then looked Grace fairly in the eyes. As I already have said, I find it difficult to credit them. Grace smiled radiantly. It seems to me that that answers the accusation, she said. In a way it does, so far as I am personally concerned, but this charge, or rather these charges, have been made in an official way, and I am therefore obliged to investigate them in an official capacity. Mrs. Gray, there is something in this matter that I do not understand. I ask you to be perfectly frank with me. It is difficult to do that without making counter-accusations which I do not care to do. I have always avoided anything of the sort, and do not care to begin now. I think I know whence these charges have come, but I think now that I do not wish to know the name of your informant. I assure you, Mr. Davis, that they are absolutely unfounded. First, I should like to ask you if there is, either in Army or Red Cross organisation regulations, anything that prohibits women in my work from acting like human beings. None that I ever heard of, was the smiling reply. No regulations that prohibit a woman from being gracious to the men who have come over here to offer their lives for us. Mr. Davis shook his head. Nor that forbid one's talking to soldiers who need cheering up and encouraging. On the contrary, it is a part of the work for which you are here, was the reply. Then these charges against me are fully answered. I will tell you, as you have asked me to do, all that I know about them. The beginning of the story dates back to the day the SS Holborn was torpedoed and only a few moments before the tragedy when I picked out a poor homesick farmer boy and made him dance with me and talked him into forgetting his troubles. I did not see him again until he walked into the canteen yesterday. I was naturally glad to see him and he appeared to be equally delighted to see me again. I spent some little time talking with him, trying to cheer him up, for he was to start for the trenches today. I did not neglect my work, for I got up several times to attend to men who came in when the other women were engaged. While talking with this man, Jonas Bartels, a woman, who announced that she was a lieutenant, called me aside and accused me of flirting at the same time declaring that such actions as mine were sufficient to send me back to the United States. Mr. Davis nodded. That is all, sir, except that I denied the lieutenant's charges, but with much less force than I ought to have put into my denial. Miss Cole and the others saw all that took place on that occasion, and I think they will 
bear me out in all that I have told you. Do you ever speak to soldiers on the street? Quite frequently. Why not? They are our own kind, and when there is no probability of my doing so being misunderstood, I stop and speak with them, ask them about their families when I can properly do so. Inquire where they are staying, and urge them to spend such time as they can with one or another of the welfare organisations. There is a work of great importance to be done on the streets of Paris, Mr. Davis, a work even more vital to the welfare of our boys than the mere pouring of chocolate and passing out sweets. Some persons might say that such work was more properly for older women to do, but I do not agree with them. It is a work we all should do, at all times exercising judgment, tact, temper and cordiality with dignity. Perhaps I have said too much, sir. Mrs. Gray, you have expressed what has been in my own mind for a long time, but which I have not considered wise to put in concrete form. It is a policy, a plan, if you will, that can be followed by the individual, but not by the workers generally, for reasons which you must understand. I think I do. A few of the splendid young women of our organisation are already following the lines suggested by you. You are at liberty to do so, and I may add that I honour you for your loyalty and high purpose. I regret exceedingly that these charges have been made, and that they have to go on record, but I shall make your exoneration as full as possible, and see that it goes on record. Thank you, sir. Today I think I will have you go out to Dewley. Do you drive an automobile? I do. That is well. You will have no difficulty in finding the way. Some supplies are necessary at the American Ambulance Hospital there, which, if you do not mind, you will take out. It is about fifty kilometres, thirty miles, which you can easily drive in a couple of hours, as the roads are in excellent condition. While there you may be able to be of some service to the officers in charge. It is extremely fortunate that you drive. We shall have much need of your services in this line of work if you do not object to taking it up. I shall be delighted, sir. Report at eleven o'clock and the car will be ready for you. You may do as you like in the meantime. Of course you understand that you must be back in Paris before dark. You might not be permitted to enter the city after that. I will see that you have the proper credentials to permit your departure and return. That will be all now. Grace left the headquarters in a much happier frame of mind than when she entered the place, and hurried toward home to make such small preparations for the journey as were necessary. On the way to her lodgings she was hailed by a familiar voice, and looking up discovered Emma Dean, in company with another woman, waving to her from a hansom. The hansom pulled up to the curb. Grace, I wish you to know the Countess, Jeanne de Beaupre. My friend, Grace Harlow Gray, Countess, of whom you have heard me speak so often. Grace acknowledged the introduction smilingly, while the Countess was gracious in the extreme. Indeed, I have felt that I knew you already, she declared in perfect English. Won't you let us take you to wherever you were going? There is room for one more, especially a person so dainty. Grace thanked the Countess and said she had but a few steps to go to reach her lodgings, adding to Emma that she was to go to Jouilly that afternoon to carry some supplies to the American ambulance there. "'You drive the car yourself?' questioned the Countess. "'How charming!' "'I should love to ride out with you. May I?' she begged, bestowed a smile on Grace." It would be a pleasure to have you do so, if there be no objection. I will ask the director, and if agreeable to you, will call for you at about a quarter after eleven. If I am not there within a few minutes of that time, you will know that permission is refused. Grace did not propose to take any unnecessary chances. She had very keen realisation that France was at war, and that regulations were very strict, necessarily so. Hurrying on to her room, after receiving the thanks of the Countess, Grace made her preparations for the journey, made a cup of tea for herself, and ate more than was good for her of those delicious French pastries. 
While sipping the tea, Grace reflected over her experiences of the day, especially on the charges that Miss Gay undoubtedly had made, and she was glad that Miss Gay was not a member of their organization, that she was merely a worker who had been made a lieutenant because having a car of her own and being of no expense to the outfit, her services were welcomed. But what Grace did not know was that she was not the only one against whom Miss Gay had entered complaints, most of them trivial and with little or no basis of fact. Her second subject of reflection was the Countess de Beaupré. While she was most charming, Grace felt there was a note of insincerity in the woman's voice. She condemned herself for this feeling or intuition or whatever it might be, but the feeling would not down. Mr. Davis had no objection to the Countess accompanying Grace, saying that she was well known in Paris and had done much for the cause of France, in whose service some of the male members of her family were prominent. Grace asked how long the Countess had lived in Paris, but Mr. Davis did not know. It will be necessary for her to have her credentials in order to get back into the city with you, but I presume that is a matter you can safely trust to her own intelligence. The car was standing at the door when Grace came out from her interview with the director. It was an ambulance bearing the insignia of the organisation conspicuously on both sides. It was loaded with surgical supplies and medicines, which were urgently needed at the American Ambulance Hospital at Dewey. After looking over the load and getting further directions from Mr. Davis, who had accompanied her down to the street, Grace started her motors, lifted the hood and examined them critically, then replacing the hood, got into the car. Grace was off with a rattle and a bang, for the car already had seen hard service and was not in the best of condition. She waved a hand at Mr. Davis as she sped away. A capable young woman. I'm glad we have her was his comment as he returned to his office to take up the work of the day. Grace drove to the home of the Countess, a handsome white stone structure a few blocks from the Arch of Triumph, drawing up before the door at exactly fifteen minutes after eleven. The Countess was waiting for her and was coming down the steps before the car stopped. She was simply but daintily dressed in a tailored linen suit, wearing on her head a simple white straw trimmed with a narrow roll of black net. A broad patent leather belt hanging loosely encircled her waist. Grace made mental note of her passenger's costume and admitted to herself that Countess Jean was certainly a most attractive woman as well as a cultured one. "'I have permission to take you with me, Countess,' greeted Grace." It is sweet of you to be burdened with me, for I am certain that I shall prove to be a burden, answered the Countess, favouring her host with a radiant smile. However, knowing the way I may be able to assist you. That indeed will be a help. As I recollect French roads and French landscapes, they all look alike. You have visited France before then? Yes, madame, once a few years ago. Grace had turned about and started down the avenue at a good rate of speed. Fast driving in Paris was the rule in peacetime, but in wartime, with so many military automobiles dashing through the streets, all speed limits were off. The driver made the most of her opportunity over the smooth asphalt streets, and turning to the right of the Avenue de l'Opera, was soon bowling along in the outskirts of Paris on what was to be an eventful journey. End of chapter 12 Recording by Ashley Jane